testing. Okay, good. Let's wait in a minute or two to see if anyone else joins us.
Okay, let's get started. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Are there any questions, issues before we start? So let's see. Um, today was the last last time I give lectures in this class. Um, starting next week, um, I will be here on Zoom at this time on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, if you've got questions about the course assignments, um, your projects. Uh, you know, I do this um, for a couple of reasons. One is um, students tend to be pretty busy at this time and to give you more time to work on projects. And I start stop talking and um, going to office hour mode. Also, I'm usually in a little you know, grading. It's giving me time to catch up on grading. So this will be our first, our last lecture. Um, I haven't checked to see if the schedule for um, college student studies courses will fall or out yet. Uh, it should be relatively soon. Uh, I also did ask the university when will they decide whether all courses will be online in the fall or we're going to meet in person. And they said that the goal is to make that decision by the end of the semester. So, we'll, so by mid-May, we should know what's going to happen in the fall. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Okay, so let's get started. Now I just share my screen and then all my windows get changed. Put the chat window back and the participant list is okay. So now I can ready. Um, so I want to talk about some tools that you might find useful um, if you become an Android developer. Uh, the first one is testing. And I think we all know intuitively this is, this is right. Um, If you write any cinnamon piece of code, you know that there are going to be bugs, you know there are going to be problems. And so typically, yeah, everyone's going to you know, run the code, see how it works, right? And um, if you're like me, it's like, okay, this should work. I know it doesn't work. Uh, I'll have to fix that. I'll fix this. Um, and then finally it's working. But even then, there, there are more subtle things you forgot about. Um, so we need a test, um, and one of the problems is, how do we want to test, right? So often we test by just running the code and seeing, giving some input and see what the output is. The, that works um, for small projects for a while. Um, the problem is that as a pop, as probably get bigger and bigger, right? You may change something over here that indirectly breaks something over here. And so you aren't run this code, it works fine. And it's not until much later you find out that it broke this over here. Um, so just doing manually testing um, at a certain point no longer works.
Đấy. Um, we all do mountain testing at some point, but it does not, um, it's not good enough. Um, you know, we really want automated tests, um, which we can run over and over again by pressing, you know, some keystroke. Years ago, I was on a project where we developed um, basically a program to use in courses like this for online chats um, instead of things like Blackboard and Canvas. And the, we hired some programmers to do this. And you know, since it was primarily a GUI based application, they didn't have tests. And there was this embarrassing moment where there was this bug that people reported. We fixed it, we thought it was done, but all the testing was done by hand. Um, and then a later release, some of the bug cracked back in again, um, but we didn't notice it because we didn't have automated tests, so we couldn't test to see that for old problems we had, we were only testing, oh, there's a new problem, make that code work. Um, we, we release the code to customer users, and lo and behold, we got the same report back saying that, that bug is back. We didn't know. Um, and that was because we were just doing manual testing, we didn't have a backlog of automated tests we could run to check things that we fixed earlier. Um, so I want to talk about automated testing and primary unit testing, where unit testing is we're testing small pieces of code. Um, now Google um, classifies tests in different sizes, um, small tests, which are unit tests, um, you, you run on your um, your machine, right? So your developer, you can run it on your machine to see if the code is working or not. Um, Medium-sized tests, um, you know, it's integration tests, making sure that the components work. You got several activities, buttons that you know, it's activity that activity that all work. Um, and you run, run them on emulator, make sure it's working in situ. Um, and then I talk about large tests for actually, um, you know, basically testing the workflow of that application. Um, again, we'll talk primarily about unit testing. Hey, Professor. Yes. Where would you place regression testing in those three categories? Um, so the question is regression testing. Um, now usually it's larger, so it's gonna be either medium or large tests, right? Okay, thank you. This is one of the graphics um, which just shows you in graphic form that you know you have far more unit tests than you've got integration tests, and more integration tests than you've got UI tests. Um, and again, just a table, you know, explains what they think, you know, what type of things you test in different. Um, what type of functionality? Um, just give me an idea. Um, you know, unit tests should be, you know, fairly fast. You don't want to wait too long. So this workflow has become quite popular 
over the last uh, you know, 10, 15 years, um, You know, when you're developing small bits of code, right? Um, you write the code, um, fix the code, so run, you know, pass the test. Um, you may then have to you add more features, you want to refactor to make it easier to use, right? And add more stuff. And, and then test sort of, you know, some new tests fail. Um, and then you go in the cycle. Um, and then when you get far enough along, then we'll try some, you know, larger tests. Um, and then repeat this development cycle. Um, so the unit testing means several things, you know, testing small components and they're automated. Um, you know, a common framework to do this is, well, it used to be called X unit. Um, but then Microsoft came out with a, a framework called XUnit. They pulled the name, uh, but now there's, you know, there's JUnit for Java. Um, and JUnit is built in. Um, Android Studio. Um, and when you build a project, you say include tests, you, you get, you know, these two directories. Um, one is for GUI testing, there's activities, and there's for unit testing. Um, right, so let's first talk about non-GUI, non-activity related. By non-activity, I mean uh, testing whether you're on start, on stop, all those lifecycle methods work. Um, and how do you know that code works? You don't know until you run it, right? Um, so we're going to run it. Um, but we want to keep on running it by hand each time because as the code gets larger, it's hard to do. Um, so we want to write test code to actually test, test it, right? Um, you know, so when you create your project, um, it creates several tests for you um, and illustrates um, you know, basic ideas. Um, one is we've got a test class, um, and then we've got several separate test methods, um, and these days we now annotate them um, with at test, tell the system these are our test functions. And then in those functions, we then run our code in some way, and then we make a search and specify this condition being met. And so we're basically saying, you know, forward five minus one, two, the same. This is a very, this is a very trivial test. Um, but the basic idea is, yeah, we're going to, um, you know, for, run some of our code, do some in, you know, input some values, run some functions, get the output, or look at the state of properties in that class, and then make a search about what should be true, um, and we're done. And then um, you know, it's basically it's built on the Android Studio. So there's this, right? Here I'm right clicking on the unit test example. I get this menu and you know, there we have a run example 
in unit tests. Um, you can also do it in the editor. Um, we have these. Like I can select it and you click on one of those and it's going to run either all the unit tests in the class or the one unit tests. Um, right. When we run a test, our menu here is remember that we ran last. Um, and so on. And then you know, use the command uh, to run our tests. We, we run the last test we wrote, we ran. And that's useful because, oh, when the test goes wrong, um, we just want to then focus in on that. So we don't need to worry about all the other tests right now. Just make sure this one test is run. So it's nice to be able to just run over and over again. Um, And when we run the tests, um, you get results. Um, and here, um, you know, one was correct and one was not. Um, right. And then you see that, yeah, it's true. Three plus four, is, three plus two is not four. Um, you also then see in the editor, um, when the test fails, it shows you which class it was in and which test failed. And here it's showing you that test ran successfully. You got any questions so far? I guess I'll take the silence as no questions. How many people have actually, actually run, um, use JUnit um, or some other testing framework? I have. Other people? It usually, uh, usually gets run when I build some sort of artifact as part of the build process. Right. And they all pass, right? And I'm not sure what it is. It used to get this, it used to be this whole bar up here would turn green or red, depending on whether it passed or failed. Now it minimizes it to be much smaller. Here's an example of, um, you know, class on our test. Um, give a slightly larger example. Um, this is stack, right? And you get the standard push things on the stack, um, the standard pop, um, and then there's a peak, and is empty in size and clear, right? It's very basic um, stack operations. Um, and then here I'm just creating a new stack, asserting that um, that stack is empty, and then I add something to a to manage script. Oh, there should be one thing in it, right? Very simple test and illustrates how these things work. Um, and the same test using um, Kotlin.
Once again, we talked about this earlier that when you run a test, whether it's a, a class or a suite or one individual test, next time you do the run test keystroke, it'll run the last thing you ran. Um, we can also run it with um, code coverage. You know, it'll tell us, give us an idea of how much code we've actually covered in our tests. Right, so you can see here, um, learning this, none of my main activity was covered, but that makes sense because I was just trying to test um, stack class. Um, there's only one class and I have tested that class. Um, I've only tested 55% of the methods and about 40% 40, 40 of the lines of code. One has to be careful with metrics like this. Um, some people then go nuts trying to cover 100% of the code coverage. Um, that's usually a bad idea. And let's see if I go back. Um, you know, I don't have many, many, many set of getters, but you really need to test the size function. Um, probably now it's a very simple function. This is returning the student size directly from the stack. So as long as push and pop work correctly, the size function is going to work. So you know, when I don't worry about testing those two functions directly. You generate a report. And reports and highlights, um, you know, what, people, what part of code was tested, not tested. And when you go on the editor after running a test, you will see these little marks showing you which was covered by your test. Um, So I'm more complicated, right? So I'm now pushing a bunch of stuff on and then popping them off, make sure they come back in the right order. Kotlin version, right? It's the same idea. Again, we can you know, look at the various metrics. We can get a report um, to see which which of the classes and methods we covered in our test. Um, there is um, before and after methods. So before method is designed to run before every method, every test method is run. Um, you know, so here's my, you know, test class, and I marked this as um, before, so every time a test method is run, that method is run first. It's just there to allow us to do some setup that we use by all methods, right? So now I don't have to, inside my test methods, create that stack each time I use it. I can assume it already exists. Um, a bunch of different asserts. Um, with after methods, we can tear things down. We can start doing things having a method run before each, each test class is run. So we do global setup for our entire class. There are various options. Um, 
you know, this is, this is an introduction to a very simple framework. So far, so good. Okay. Um, we can do some Android testing directly. Um, and the problem is, right, Laravel code needs a context. Um, you know, if, you want, if you want to make sure when you click on a button, certain things happen, that requires an activity to be created. Um, we need access to that context. Um, and you cannot create an activity fragment directly because the fragment and the activity need have an environment that they um, run in. And You know, so any, any sort of logic that requires UI or OS events require a special environment. Um, there are a number of different frameworks you can use, you know, in Android. Um, and there's various examples of doing it. Um, You know, we can actually um, you know run tests that use the context. Um, what, what this test is doing is, is very simple. It's actually creating an instance of my activity, um, and then I'm just making sure the activity is is mine. But the key thing here is this thing is actually creating an instance of my activity. Right. Um, Expresso, which is built into Android Studio, is good for UI testing. Um, you can write tests. Um, but it's pretty complicated to, without some help. Um, but you can record UI actions and then modify those tests. And, um, here's a simple setup. Um, where I have an activity and I've got a button on the screen and the button just runs its function go now and all the function does is it sets x to 10 I mean, it's a pretty silly thing but it's a very small example to illustrate the point. Um, in the run menu there's an item to run Record expressive tests. Um, and then what happens is you actually run your application, and Android is going to record that test for you. Um, yeah, I thought that was a. Uh, um, here we go. So here is I click on the button. Um, Right, and an assertion. Um, right, so what I've done here so far is I ran my code. Um, recorded it, and this is what was created for me, right? It's, um, 
using Google's terminology, they call it a large test because I'm testing the application and the GUI. Um, and right then we, we grab the reference that button and then it performs a click, right? But I don't have any assertions yet. Um, so I can go and edit that test to have that assertion. Uh, it's just easier for me to do it manually rather than use their GUI to do this. Um, right, and so I'm basically asserting the value of right again this activity test rule. I give it my name of my class. It gives me reference to it. So now I can uh, give me the activity with the value, insert that, that value should be 10. All right, so let's make it literally start doing things in the GUI, record them, and then go on those tests later and make our certs. Um, and then we, we've got these tests we can run automatically, make sure that our GUI application is still performing that's desired. Oh, yes. Um, no. Um, Yeah, Java have these static imports, um, right? The main way of doing this, right? Then I call cosine is in the math library. Um, I can use the static import to basically reduce that to cosine. Um, I don't need the math dot cosine, but it looks like if you're not used to it. It looks weird because. Typically, when you call a function in your class, that function or method is either part of that class in Java or in its parent class. Um, and here we're calling a function that's really not in our class or the parent class. Um, And so some of their tests start looking like this. Um, on view, right, you know, check. Um, it makes it easy to read because it, on this view. I'm checking to make sure the value matches the figure value. But when you look at these generated tests, it's like, well, where are these functions coming from? And they're using static imports. Um, This is a pretty current trend. The um, people are trying to write the tests in the framework so that the tests can be read by non-programmers. The basic idea is that when you get when you're doing large tests, the tests in the application, what should be doing. Um, if you've got a customer who is paying you to do this, then they're the ones who are telling you what should happen. Um, what calculation you do, and so then you tell them, okay, you said that on these imports they should come out, and the goal is okay to make sure that that the tests we're doing here can be understood by them without having to be a you know programmer. Um, and here's what it looks like with all clothes. It's not as easy to read, but now it becomes clear where those functions are coming from, right? Um, 
Yeah. Um, and I'll just specify what what to use to run the test. Um, Yeah, I can skip over some of these. No, I think some slave methods are useful. You might use special tests on view. Um, you know, close the keyboard, press the back button. Right? And so clearly it's set up to actually run the application and give you functionality to test. You know, you click the back button, I should not go back to this activity. Um, You know, various functions to allow us to match various things in a code. Mm. You now, so here's a very simple example of an application of test. And all it does is, is expect click the button, the value increases, right? Can't get much simpler than that. Um, and so here are some tests. Um, you now, first, I want to get access to. Um, you know, activity. Um, here I'm just testing to make sure that things are on the screen, that right, my view count is there. Um, right, it's actually is displayed, that my increased text is there, or well, my button is there, and my count, my count view starts at zero. Right, very simple test. So I'll do test initial state of my application and then I'm also testing my initial state of my field in the activity. Um, and now right what I need to do is I click the button and as the button's done right um the value of display should be one. Again, we're testing that the UI work the interact with the UI and we get the result we want. And these are all nice little headers. Um Yeah, so, you know, we can, um, right, here's my entire test. Um, so we can write unit tests for our non-GUI, non-activity related code, and we have Expresso um, all those to record some of the tests and also write them ourselves, write tests to make sure that our application is doing it's supposed to. Um, and monkey testing is sort of interesting. It just generates a bunch of random events and records, records what happens to you, happens to the application. Right, this bunch of random stuff. And the ADB um, program allows you to connect to your application and you know, I'm telling it to run the shell and the shell run the monkey tests. So you have to specify, you know, what, which um, package I'm trying to run and how many tests I want to run. Now, 
Initially, it seemed like a, a weird thing to do to just throw random things at you at your application. You've got a text field, this is essentially random text. Um, see what happens. Um, but you will definitely um, be testing situations you wouldn't test by hand. You know, what happens when you just type in some random nonsense? Um, there was a famous example where um, someone actually discovered a security hole in virtual machines. Um, it was, you know, once thought that if you put a virtual machine on your machine on your on your computer and run, you know, say you were on you're on a Windows machine. And then you put the virtual machine and run a Mac OS on it. It was assumed that, yeah, you were safe to whatever you wanted to on that Mac OS. Um, because even if, you know, you're surfing the web and the Mac OS and got a virus because you did something, you went to the wrong website, the assumption was the online operating system was fine. You could just, you know, delete that virtual machine and replace it with another one. Um, but some researchers just ran monkey tests in uh, a virtual machine. Um, and eventually the, the, the monkey test um, was able to somehow, again, just doing random events in the operating system, um, affect the underlying operating system and that allowed the researchers to discover, okay, ah, oh, here's how we can now do something in the virtual machine to actually corrupt underlying operating system. And it was monkey testing that you know, helped discover that. You know, an example is just running it, you need lots of output. Okay, um, another, another important thing you need know to do is the performance testing, measuring. Um, for the applications right for this class, it's not a problem, but if you're writing real applications, at some point, the application may run slow at times, and then you want to figure out why, or maybe taking more memory than you like, um, and so you need to figure out what's going on. And even though Java has you know, garbage collection, you can still collect um, excess memory. Um, you know, if your activity goes in the background and stays in the background, your activity has reference to various objects. Those objects cannot be garbage collected. And so an activity has a, a reference to a large object, like a large file or a sound file. Um, that object can't be garbage collected because your activity has a pointer to it and your activity is in the back stack and so um, it's still reachable, right? So um, when you run your application in Android Studio now, at the very bottom, there is this profiler tab. Um, and you can click on that tab, and then you can run your application. It will show you um, the RS performance metric. And let me say run the video. So here it is, it's showing you. Whoops, and I'll do that. Start it again. Now, right, so it's showing you the CPU usage, memory usage. Um, when I start you know, adding things, and go, you know, I can see the memory go up a little bit. Um, you see that the energy use has increased. You, you can hover over it and see what's going on. You know, the time, 
Um, yeah, if we took on one of those detailed view, you know, if we, now we're going to see the usage and then record it. Um, and do, you know, some operations. And just And I stop recording. Now it's showing me, um, you know, what was running the very at the at the time. Um, right after having to see what what was taking lots of time. A lot of what we're seeing is you know, most activity is system level. Um, And now if we put on top down, it shows you, okay, the main, et cetera, you know, various, you know, if it scrolls down, eventually we'll find our methods. Um, here is you know, the bottom up looking at um, various methods that they run. Um, you know, most of, the, most of the time was spent doing system calls you can see the law things in your We can start looking. And we can look at our memory. Um, we're looking at, you know, what's, what's taking all the memory and different items here. How much, how much allocated, how much total space is taken up. And, you know, one warning is if you remember starts doing Things like this, there's three jumps, and never goes down. And that's a good sign that um, you're hanging on to memory and never releasing it. So these are just some tools that you can use to, you know, unit testing to help out your testing. Um, you know, I just tell students, look, you know, at the end of the semester, of these projects, and the closer and closer you get to the, the deadline of the project, the more nervous you get, right, about making changes to your project. Um, these things might break, and then, you know, it's one in the morning, you know, assignments due the next day, and you broke something, and you're very tired, and then you're trying to figure out what went wrong, how to go back to make it look again. Um, Using unit tests um, helps release some of stress because then you can run tests and find out sooner that you broke something. And the sooner you find out that you broke that something, you can just find out what went wrong and correct it. Um, another thing is if you use a version control system and Git, it's basically Git, I mean, you can use Git directly inside of Android Studio. So it's, it's just very simple to use. Um, use those two. That should really reduce the stress on you when you're closer and closer to your project deadline. Um, and if you think you get stressed out doing projects, um, you know, what happens when you're going, you know, working for a company, um, you're the product will be shipped by a certain date. Um, that's a lot more stressful because it's much, much, much bigger, far more complicated. Um, you know, if the product ships with major defects, it's going to affect the company, um, earnings, and if you're in charge of making it work right, um, there's a major blow up in this, you're, you're going to be in trouble 
So the stress of work is much higher. And we need ways to reduce that, right? And unit testing and using birth control can really, really reduce that stress. And then there's you know, performance testing and it's built in, it's easy to use. I mean, it's basically a few buttons and you have it. And that is all I prepared for today. Um, any questions or issues? Uh, yeah, I just had a quick question. Yeah. Uh, it's more personal, though. I was wondering if you had time to regrade my uh, project yet, the one you have on screen currently. Um, no, I, was gonna, I didn't quite get to it, but the reason it's on the screen is like, I'm not going to check out Andrew Studio until it's done. I'm sorry? I'm not going to exit Andrew Studio until I grade your assignment. Oh, OK, thank you. <laughs> Professor, okay. Go ahead. Uh, so this is kind of like, I know that unit tests and testing in general kind of validate your code, but yeah. is it common for it to, uh, for someone to go back and validate the test itself? I don't know if that makes sense, but like, is it ever, does it ever occur where you know you you initially write your unit test and it does what it intends to do, but there may come a time in the future where changes may need to be made to such a unit test? Well, yeah, several things happen. Um, so let me talk about various scenarios. Um, you know, one scenario is not quite your question, but I'll get there is that when you're writing code, right, um, usually the programmer who writes the test also writes the code. Um, and so the problem becomes that that program may have blind spots. And so they won't write tests for their blind spots. And the code doesn't handle those blind spots. And so then the tests run, but there's problems there because they they just don't think about doing these type of features. Um, so there's two things you want to do to avoid that. Um, one is, um, I like to think of wearing two different hats. Um, when I'm writing tests, it's like, what can possibly go wrong? Um, so it's like, okay, what, what can I do to break the application? And the professor um, in Utah, what he does is says, look, um, he tells his class, I want you to write unit tests to break your fellow students' code, right? Don't worry about writing unit tests for your code, just write tests to, you know, show me that your colleagues aren't doing the right thing, right? And he says, why don't you say it that way, the students write really good tests. Because they're really going to try and knock out each other out, right? Prove that they're smarter than everyone else. Um, but helps with that mindset of looking, what could possibly break um, before you start writing a code. The other thing to do is um, keep track of the mistakes you make so that when you come to a situation again, like, okay, oh, I'm running a for loop, but I start at one or start at zero, or end at n or n minus one. We often make those errors, right? We get those boundary points wrong. So, okay, that's something we should test. Now, more to your question. Um, there are several things that can happen. Um, one is, you write a bunch of tests, right? Um, so I get hundreds of tests, and then as the product evolves, um, 
we keep on finding every time we modify a function over here, we have to modify three or four tests. Um, and then those tests start to become slowest down. We're making minor changes to the name of the method and it's on it's like the over the tests. Um, yeah, that can happen. Um, and then you have to ask yourself, do we still need those tests? Um, you know, the unit tests, your initial value is great because it helps us avoid bugs. Um, and also when you find a bug, it's usually write a test first and then make that test pass. But after we fix that bug, those tests, um, the value goes down a bit because now the value is making sure we don't repeat that particular bug. Um, in that particular piece of code. Um, but you may get lots of tests we no longer need. The other thing that can happen is, well, the best story I came across is there's a company, and I've actually forgot the name of the company, it's like, can't even, um, I didn't hear it myself. They had a test suite that would run overnight. And so every day, at the end of the day, they would check all the code into the product, you know, this application, where it was. And then overnight, um, you know, they had automated system to build the, build the system and then we ran it on its tests. And then you'd come in the morning and then you got the results of your tests, right? And one day, they came in, there's also tests, you know, nearly all the tests passed, um, but someone realized, oh, wait a minute, there was a problem with the build, and so the application wasn't built, and so the test framework was running against nothing, and it, the test still passed. Um, you know, which made them nervous because the tests have evolved over time, and no one knows that lost their test cases. Um, we're going to always return true no matter what happens. Um, so tests do decay over time. The value does decay over time. Um, and I do know of one company, you know, they had, you know, like 20 or 30,000 tests of that for the product, so. Sounds good, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? Like I said, um, next week I'll be sitting in my, my computer here um, if you've got questions, um, issues with your projects, um, but I won't be lecturing anymore next two weeks. And if no more questions, we can call it a night and get back to work. Thank you. Okay.